point, been in tech for about 20 years. I've held just about every title in tech that you can think of. I've worked with some companies you may have heard of, and I've recently started a consulting company called Ergonatic with Andrew Clay Schaefer and Jay Bloom. Now, there are many foundations going into building successful software and a successful business. Some of them are way easier to get funded than others, right? One that is easy to get funded usually is innovation. So innovation, both groundbreaking innovation, also new features that differentiate your business, also shiny new technology like AI is today, or like microservices or big data or IoT or yesterday are really easy to get funding for. But innovation is only the tip of the iceberg. And it's built upon many components, some of which are technical excellence, platform engineering, and reliability. Let's talk about them in a little bit more detail. So the first pillar is technical excellence. And to me, this is the opposite of technical debt. Technical debt, this is when you actively go and invest in maintaining and improving your code base as you go. This happens very rarely. And we have this idea in technology industry that technical debt happens only when you make bad decisions. So this is Nokia 3310. Who here had this phone? Who thought it was a great piece of technology? Who would own it today? Not so many. Even if you really wanted to, it would be really difficult to function with it because it's 24 years old today. But in software, we try to do this all the time. We run 30-year-old code bases, and we're being pointedly asked, why aren't they functioning flawlessly? Why haven't you planned it correctly? But even if you made the perfect design decisions at the time, it wouldn't keep up. Now, in hardware, we understand this. So if your company owns a car, there's somewhere a car depreciation graph, and it's understood that it requires maintenance, that it requires, that depreciates over time, and eventually needs to be replaced. Why aren't we applying this to software? Now, the second underfunded pillar is platform engineering. This is a cool new trend that everyone at this conference is talking about, except it's not really new. If you are in DevOps, you have always been building platforms because platform is required for you to automate cross-cutting concerns. Now, one of the surprising things is no matter how many platform as a service offers you're paying for, you still need a custom platform to run your actual software, except for maybe if you're running a static website. And the second surprising thing is even if you think you don't have a platform, you actually already do. In the worst case scenario, your platform is made of people. And for many companies, ServiceNow is their backend API and Brent is their backend service. Now, in a different case that I think Scott mentioned today, there is a well-funded platform team that is building a platform that no one uses. And then there are other software teams trying to feverishly build shadow platforms that they actually need to run their software. The third underfunded pillar is reliability. Reliability is availability plus stability plus quality plus some other illities. If availability means that my application is up and running, reliability means that it's actually doing what my users expect it to do. Now, reliability is more important than ever, but it isn't getting any better funding. It's as if we used to drive an old clunky car and we took a weekend off and we fixed it up ourselves and it all was fine. And now the expectations of our business are completely different. Now we're supposed to drive a Formula One car and we're supposed to be able to take it on, offline, service it in 15 seconds and bring it back online. Except we still have the same car, the same team and the same training budget. Now, my guess is that depending on where you are in the organization, you're experiencing the lack of funding of one of these pillars more than the other pillars, right? And my suggestion here is that we start talking to our CFOs about how software and hardware funding are actually maybe not as different as we think. Now, if you are in business and you're making money, then your platform is functioning. But if it is made of people, that it's actively burning them out because they're doing the maintenance and all of that work on top of their regular jobs. And if your business is expecting your applications to be as reliable, responsive, and well-made as their favorite consumer applications like Gmail or Facebook, then they need to also understand that SRE teams and ops teams need adequate funding and staffing to make it happen. Lastly, let's start talking about software depreciation. So it's understood that software isn't supposed to function indefinitely without maintenance or improvement. So this is it for me, and I hope we get to talk about it some more in open spaces. So I'll be still speaking about uh, Gen AI today as well. So just yeah, keep up with me. 
So just to update, right, uh, we all know generative AI is emerging as one of the fastest growing technology in recent years. It has the potential to revolutionize tech industry with new innovation. When it comes to DevSecOps workspace, work, workspace, let us see how we can integrate Gen AI into it. In major components such as coding, integrations in build and security pipelines, and with respect to operation support. Gartner Research projects that by 2027, AI software industry will grow close to $300 billion in value, which means soon we'll start seeing more and more AI application. So I hope you guys remember Jarvis from Iron Man. He's Tony Stark's AI sidekick who used to help him save the world. Well, we have our own version, Vida. Very intelligent DevSecOps assistant. Vida is an AI streamlined virtual assistant who, you know, who streamlines, uh, uh, you know, messages in the chat prompt based issues. So coming to this part, instead of speaking about Gen AI, I'll be referring to Vida throughout my presentation. We all know in our traditional workflow challenges, as simple as provisioning a VM or you know, fixing build errors or project management, all of this, we, we know how these tasks used to slow us down. Now, how do you like these tasks to be explicitly handled by your virtual assistant? That's where Vida comes in. Vida would be able to identify and analyze these tasks for you and automate them and make it work as per your request. One of the example is we built an internal software, virtual software assistant who used to do the same for different set of tasks. And one example that comes into my mind is it used to provision a VM and then used to give the access key spe specific to that VM so that when we were done using it, we were able to clean it up as well. This is just one simple example where this was useful, right? So let us see in all other aspects where this would be useful. Okay, Vida can be useful in, uh, you know, on our DevSecOps code review, testing and monitoring, impact, and we can also find out some parts in impact measurement as well. Coming to the continuous integration aspect, which includes code, build, and test, we can find that uh, in uh, Vida would be helpful in analyzing the continuous integration and deployment pipelines, be it integration issue, delivery pipelines, or management issues for your pipeline. So Vida would be able to you know, analyze this and help us provide with a solution for us. When it comes to, uh, I, I was about to say this part, so continuous integration part when it comes to build code and test, Vida would help us to build our entire CI CD pipeline based on the stages that you define and the configuration that you specify. It can even analyze your code and provide continuous feedback for us with automatic approvals by regulating the issues and vulnerabilities in your codes. Vida can write and you know, generate unit test cases for us, providing up to 90% of code coverage, which means it reduces defects in your application, and it can basically provide automation test pipeline by reducing manual effort. When it comes to operation aspects, Vida would help in harnessing, like you know, uh, efficiently making your deployment processes and improve it. And it also uh, helps out in operation part, monitoring, and security aspect. In project management and automated in uh, ticket generation aspect, Vida would be the best AI assistant where it will help analyze your project, raise issues and you know a risk analysis, and it can also help with reporting of your application. And it can do ticket tracking and also make sure that all your applications are in time for the sprint. When it comes to security aspect, Vida would be helpful in identifying and analyzing it for intelligent crawling and intelligent crawling and attack mechanism, making sure that it is much more secure. In monitoring, we can see that it does predictive analysis and maintenance, and it, it can also do anomaly detection for your application monitoring. So what does this all mean? Like, you know, we keep saying Gen AI, and what's the impact and everywhere? Basically, it increases efficiency of your system, it reduces manual effort, and it can make sure that your application release timeline can be reduced by up to 40%. By this, I can conclude that generative AI will transform the tech industry as we know it. It's here to stay, and the only way to move forward is to adapt and embrace it. I'm Shruti Baskar, Senior DevOps Consultant from Polo IT. Thank you.
Hey, I'm now responsible for designing and architecting the um, container infrastructure for the Dutch Ministry of Defense at the moment. And there we have some challenges around um, multi-cloud, multi-Kubernetes environments across uh, different environments. So it's a complex architecture when you're doing multi-cloud because a lot of companies decide to go multi-cloud and uh, you don't have uh, all the uh, heterogeneous APIs. They all have their own uh, characteristics. So you want to simplify this with uh, Kubernetes cluster management in some way to avoid vendor lock-in, uh, optimize your costs, and also have a high availability across multiple zones in your cloud environments. So benefits of multi-cluster management is that you have uh, less cost of your infrastructure because you share your infrastructure. You have simplified operations across your cluster, uh, Kubernetes clusters, and you have more flexibility and portability of your applications. Um, you have a centralized control plane for your ops uh, guys to manage your cl clusters, your Kubernetes clusters. So I would like to discuss today uh, two versions of multi-cloud tools. One is OpenShift and the second one is Rancher. And why is this? Uh, within the Dutch Army, we have two versions of it, and we are trying out both of them. Uh, we use OpenShift, but we also use uh, plain Kubernetes. So the first of all is uh, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management. It's a tool for centralized management of your uh, clusters. You have one managed cluster hub, and it manages all your OpenShift clusters within your uh, on-premises or uh, cloud infrastructure. And you can centrally define and enforce policies, which is a very hot topic within the army at the moment. Uh, you have a more uh, visibility into compliancy because uh, there are a lot of compliancy rules. So this is uh, something uh, about the structure, the, the architecture of uh, Rackham, which we call it. You have the uh, client, you have the multi-hub cluster, and you have a client somewhere in a worker node or a uh, OpenShift cluster. Um, there are a lot of uh, issues around scalability and how you, um, uh, how you uh, size your, your Kubernetes clusters, but you can implement all kinds of stuff like auto scaling using Ansible, for instance. And now I go to Rancher, which is also a tool used within the Dutch army uh, for um, more the traditional IT uh, at the moment, which are also running already Kubernetes. I'm on a project which uh, uh, is uh, busy renewing the digitalized uh, environment of the, of the army. So it's also a tool to multi-manage uh, your clusters. Um, you want to empower your DevOps teams to give them also a centralized place for developing and for managing their applications. So you have one GUI, you have a CLI and an API to, uh, uh, yeah, to auto-remediate your, uh, your uh, environment to, to uh, provision your environment as well. Uh, your Kubernetes clusters, you have catalog management, you have a uh, integrated uh, st uh, part with your service meshes, for instance, to leverage uh, APIs to your uh, uh, application deployments. Uh, you can use it for your GitOps-based uh, deployments. You can do configuration management on a GitOps base, so you can uh, 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 deploy your, uh, your uh, Kubernetes environment using GitOps configuration management. Um, so best practices for multi-management in Kubernetes is that you use some kind of a declarative way of uh, configuring, configuring your conf uh, Kubernetes clusters. You can do automated provisioning with, uh, with Ansible, for instance, and you can also uh, do monitoring using centralized uh, logging to push it to some kind of an IT operations data pay pipeline using uh, tools like Elastic or anything like that. You have a, uh, some differences between uh, Rackham and Rancher. Uh, Rackham is usually used to manage OpenShift clusters, although you can also manage non-OpenShift clusters, but why would you do that? Because it costs you extra money, and uh, uh, Rancher is uh, actually uh, free. So uh, benefits for your DevOps teams is that it's consistent, it's simple, you can enforce policies, so you can uh, uh, enforce them uh, uh, across your entire organization, and you also have simplified monitoring and management for your ops teams. So these are uh, my uh, slides for the moment. Very quick discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Um, perfect. 
Um, how many of you have heard of distributed tracing? Okay, few hands. How many of you are using metrics and logs to monitor your applications? Okay, few hands. So I'll be talking about distributed tracing and why it matters. Um, first thing is why we are talking about distributed tracing. Um, I mean, we have seen a couple of uh, application owners here who are building super apps, very complex app, talking to third party APIs, microservices. And the challenge with distributed tracing is trying to solve is lack of visibility. When we are building applications which are super large, super applications, multiple teams, multiple microservices, one thing which we miss is how do we coordinate? How do we even visualize what's happening across the ecosystem of these applications? Um, and why this happened? Because user demand. We scaled a lot during COVID. People are building more digital applications, more user-centric applications, and businesses are scaling. What this is, is actually, um, you can call it a death star of Amazon and Netflix microservices. That's the level of complexity which it can reach at scale when you're trying to build more and more complex apps, trying to get new businesses. With more complexity, obviously comes more failure scenarios. You are building an application which is, um, okay. this complex, a lot of lambdas, different databases, different streams. When something breaks inside this application, it will take a lot of time for you to even actually realize why it is working. You need a lot of people, you need a couple of people. But a lot of, lot of application teams say, okay, but we have monitoring in place. Why we are talking about distributed tracing? I have metrics, I have logs, I can actually figure out why. But when we look at the whole stack, monitoring is something which you do when you already know what you want to monitor. Observability is about asking questions. Observability about asking questions or knowing things which you actually don't know with metrics and just logs. Uh, distributed tracing can help you to answer a lot of complex questions like, okay, if a request failed, why it failed? Where it failed? Who are my users who actually were affected because of that certain failure scenario? Uh, what is the root cause of an incident? How quickly I can actually do it? So we talked about why we are talking about distributed tracing. Let's look about what is actually distributed tracing. So in any, any application, when you start with a request, it actually flows through a path. So you have whether your client sessions, you have your load balancers, you have your um, application instances. Distributed tracing is about um, like method of actually tracing when your request flows through that journey. Uh, right from the moment your client starts a request, goes to databases, performance streams, each and everything, depending on how you're doing it, you can actually trace. Um, some of the basic concepts of distributed tracing are a trace, which is an end-to-end -end trace, which is made about different spans. Like uh, a browser application, that's one span. Uh, API web server, that's a one span. And then there are actually header which um, have that trace ID, which helps you to actually visualize that whole thing. There are different tools which you can help you to do that, like there's Zipkin, um, New Relic, Honeycomb, Open Telemetry, which is obviously getting more and more popular in terms of integrations. Uh, AWS X-Ray is one of the easiest one to get started with if you are on AWS. This is what tracing looks like when you are talking, like when you are looking at Jaeger, you can literally trace the whole request, whether it is your cache, your database, your front end, uh, your MySQL, you can look at the whole thing. This is what tracing looks like if you are using AWS X-Ray. Uh, it's an application which is talking to a database, which is calling another Lambda. You can see that whole service map, and then it will tell you the health of your application in one snapshot. Also, you can drill down in traces, like inside deep traces to look at what my individual trace did, how much time it actually took for that particular trace to execute it, where the application failed. Um, and then obviously along with traces, AWS X-Ray gives you other metrics as well, which are your traditional metrics, your failures, your response time, your um, latency and all those metrics. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all about tracing for today. Thank you so much. So for the last three years, my team and, uh, and myself have been spending quite a fair bit of time trying to help people, our customers who run Java workload to be able to spend their evenings and their weekend with their family. So 
I am Jeff. I'm a director, senior director with uh, Java Platform Group in Oracle. So I run this service called Java Management. So it's, a, of course, a cloud service, very elegant. It runs 24-7, but underneath it, there's a lot of peddling that's happening. So one of the directives that we had from corporate with Oracle is that everything everywhere. So your service needs to be living in all the regions that we have. We have 48 regions right now and still counting. Uh, that include commercial and so on. So what I'm trying to share today is basically five top things I feel that what I've learned that can be applied to any of the service providers or anyone that is running cloud, uh, cloud services to basically scale up. So number one, know your production. I think you need to know your production system like the back of your hands. You need to know what is in there and you need to know what is going in there as well. So one of the things which is very important for that, and I, I personally invest quite a lot on it, is change management. So you need to have a very proper change management. So not only it is about executing those changes, but also the audit trail that you will need when things happen, when you need to follow it back. And there's a lot of conversation about deployment and deployment planning. I couldn't emphasize any more how important it is. So it, it is actually very, very important. Even things like you know, making sure that there's no URL in it so that you click and you, you are dead. You, you know, the, the internet is down, you don't know what to do. Second is know your service killers. So every, every system will have a service killers. So know your service killer. What, what is your Achilles heels? And then have the corresponding run books so that your support or anyone that is running it is able to help. Number two, compliance and assurance. <clears throat> being, being a global service, uh, different geos have different regulations that we have to deal with. So there's a lot of things that we have to deal with in terms of being compliance and having assurance. A few things to get there. Standards. Keep with the standards. Don't deviate. If you, if you don't deviate that much, it's a good chance that you are okay. Have a system that has resilience, being on the cloud. Typically, you are quite resilient, built for it. Uh, risk and crisis management, I think from, from, a, from our perspective, in terms of you know, hacking, is not only the only thing that will impact us, but things like how we operate, our branding, our strategy is as important for us to move forward. Next was uh, network and security. Setting up your network is really very, very part, important part of your, uh, of your cloud offering. Network will definitely help you segment and improve your security. Have a blueprint of your network, where your control plane, data plane, I think some of you guys have touched upon it, and look for security, look at things that has already been approved. How, how and you know, the best practices on how you keep secrets, things doesn't leak out. Number four, data, metrics, and measurements. So there's a lot of data that you need to keep, uh, for sure. So how do you make sense of the data? put some metrics around it, and put some measurements around it. Again, there's a lot of conversation around it. There's mature system that will be able to help you. Define your operation bars. Uh, there's a few things that will go in into your operation bar. So basically, what your service needs to meet before it can goes into production, before it actually runs. I'll give you some example to it. One of it is canaries, right? Having a system that have a canaries that is constantly testing your system is actually quite important. Having probes, having tracing, like the previous speaker has said, is very, very important so that you know what is happening. If there's an issue, you're able to ask those questions. Lastly, consistent reviews. I think this is very, very important things that we take for granted, especially if we are not prompt. And there's a few of the things that is always constantly reviewed, at least for my services. One is permission and access. I think earlier in the morning, Scott did mention about it about people coming in and going out of your team and they still have access to your production system. So we run every two weeks to make sure that you know, no one get into, uh, have the right access. Second is disaster recovery and availability. Extremely important for us as well. So we need to make sure that our system can be discovered uh, and we have our own S uh, SLOs. So in terms of disaster recovery, we do a tabletop exercise and we also do a uh, yearly review. After action review process is very important as well that we do because when shit hit the fan, you need somebody to go and go do this without the blame. So thank you very much. That's my last slide. This is Heather Thacker. I'm a developer advocate at Chef. Um, I used to be a baker and so I was learning to code while developing recipes. 
So this analogy is between DevOps and baking. We'll go through plan, deploy, monitor, and build for DevOps, and baking, mix, bake, uh, feedback. Before we get started, two things. Philosophy of culture is very much the foundation of both DevOps and baking. Um, DevOps is a collaboration between operations and development, and baking is dependent on fermentation for development of recipes. So, let's see here, catching up. The second aspect to, aspect to consider is automation. For a viable business model, we need a healthy economies of scale, and to get there, we learn to mix by hand to learn the craft, and then we mix by machine to grow the business. Okay, I can breathe now. Um, so let's look, let's look at the stages of baking and DevOps, first starting with planning and prep. Um, in tech, the answer to most questions begins with, it depends. So what are you building? What does it look like? Who is it for? We need the answers to this in excruciating detail to set up ourselves for success. Do our scripts and recipes cover every step in our build or bake process? Are there enough resources for our busiest days? Are we moving fast enough so the butter doesn't melt? Timing is everything. <laughs> DevOps grew largely as a solution to the bottleneck created between um, passing tasks over the fence from development to operations and back again. So uh, bakers, we are super aware of the passage of time. We uh, know that a few seconds can make a difference. Everything has to align, like the seasonality of apples, a perfectly relaxed and cold pie dough, and the golden image of a perfectly baked pie crust. We have a lot of elements to consider in order to set ourselves up for success. The more we understand each piece of the pie for a final product before getting started, the smoother everything will go. Ideally, by the time that we're building and mixing, everything is ready for us to piece together products as we've envisioned. We've considered each step, each script, each asset needed, and our environments are ready. Yet, we cannot control everything. Tech and baking, uh, we both plan for delays, unknowns, errors, and with experience, we know how to handle any mishap. We do our best to minimize variability and rely on our teammates for help. At best, we have high confidence about the final product at this stage. Dependencies have been considered, resources allocated, taste tests are complete, everything is behaving as expected. So let's deploy our applications and bake our bread. This part relies heavily on the faith in our tooling. We want to have our environments ready so that everything is good and green, no red errors or flames from burning bread, even though those make for really fun stories. We need to trust our tools are configured properly to our needs. Are the environment variables correct? Are the tests dependable? Is there plenty of space in the oven so that we don't need to peek in and ruin the bake? We need accurate monitors, logs, and a clear view of what is happening during the deploy and bake stage. Um, in case we need to intervene and adjust something or stop a big disaster from happening and ruining uh, production. So assuming a successful deployment and a happy bake, we can rest easy with clear indicators of a robust production. It's time to let customers and users enjoy the final, uh, enjoy the treats of our due diligence and cultivate satisfaction. It's important to spend time with the final products and understand how people engage with what we've created. And ideally, we have insight into the first impressions, interpretations, interactions, in order to influence future iterations. Iterating and adjusting our DevOps and baking cycles allow for growth, success, establishing systems and processes that lead us to a sense of accomplishment so that we can all win together. So in conclusion, DevOps is delicious. Sprinkle it onto your software development life cycle. And thank you all for listening. And yeah, I'll see you later and tomorrow. And here are a few ways to connect.